So Kathy and I, we've been married a long time. We've been married 38 years. And one of the reasons we've lasted that long is we've, we still go on dates. And not every week, but most every week, I take Kathy out for lunch. And uh, find a day off, take her out for lunch. The reason I take her out for lunch is dinner is way too expensive, so I'm not springing for that. <laughs> so. <laughs> Welcome to Church of the Rock from Winnipeg. Stay tuned to this week's thought-provoking message from Pastor Mark Hughes. Well, today I'm starting a brand new series called A More Excellent Way. And I'll tell you what it's about. It's really about something the Lord's been dealing with me personally, but why should I suffer alone? And so I'm going to share it with you. And it's actually all about this subject called love. And, uh, you know, here's what I want to say right at the outset. You know, when it comes to the universal language, the one universal language I think is love. I mean, it doesn't matter where you go on the planet. There's different languages, different cultures, and different types of civilizations throughout history and throughout the world. And there's one thing we all have in common is we understand what it is to love and love is really the thing that makes the world go round. It's so vitally important. And it's, it's interesting as you look through history and you look at how man has expressed himself through literature and through novels and through poetry and through movies and through music. And it's always that singular theme of love. 78% of all new songs are about love. And that statistic includes Taylor Swift, which is 100% about breaking up, right? And so, <laughs> so that might skew it just a little bit. Uh, you know, here's what happened. I'll give you a little story about this. So one day, my mom and I, we were standing right over here talking, and this, this guy came up, and uh, he said hi, and I said hi back to him, and my mother went over to him, gave him a big high hug, and said, oh, there's my favorite guy, and gave him this big hug, and we talked to him for about two minutes, and then he left. And then my mother turns to me in her inimitable style, and she says, now, who was that again? <laughs> And I said, I have no idea. I assumed he's like your boyfriend or something, <laughs> the way you hugged him. And she said, well, I don't know who he was either, but he looked like he needed a hug. <laughs> and you know what? I thought, you know, that's my mom. And if you're feeling down, if you need some love today, my mom's sitting right over there. And uh, I, can, I can send her over and she can take care of you because she'll love you. We all need a little love in this world. It's, it's like the story, one of my favorites. This couple's going through a real time with their marriage. Finally, they agree to go to marriage counseling, and they're sitting talking while she's talking. And she's going on and on, this big, long list of all the things wrong with her husband. I can't imagine such a thing. But anyway, she's going on, and she's just nonstop talking. Finally, the marriage counselor gets up, comes out from behind his desk, grabs her by the cheeks, and plants a big, fat, wet kiss right on her mouth. Just lays it right on her mouth. She is dumbfounded and comes completely silent. And then he turns to the husband and says, all she needs is one of those twice a week and all your problems are solved. <laughs> he says, fantastic. I can bring her by Tuesdays and Thursdays. <laughs> So this series that we're going to talk about today is all about love and how powerful love is. And particularly, my message is entitled, Love Never Fails. So we're going to start, we're going to look at a verse here. It's uh, at the very end of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it's verse 31. And it says this, But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Everybody say a more excellent way. So here's what happen it's happening here. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about the gifts of the Spirit, right? He's talking about miracles, he's talking about healings, he's talking about tongues and interpretation and prophecy and all this wonderful, wonderful stuff. And then he says, earnestly desire those best gifts, yet let me show you a more excellent way. And we will find out in just a moment that the more excellent way he was talking about was love. And he said, if you're going to do these gifts, it's great to you, for you to want these gifts. It's great for you to want to be powerful. It's great for you to want to see God's working in the earth. But let me give you a more excellent way. If you're going to do it, do it in love. And then he goes right into it in the next verses here, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. And he says, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, 
I become a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but not have love, I, it profits me nothing. He says, I can do all these things. He says, I can prophesy, and I can speak this kind of wisdom, but if I don't do it in love, you know what I am? I'm just a bunch of noise. I'm just a clanging cymbal and a sounding brass. I'm just a bunch of empty noise. He says, I could have faith that I could move mountains, but if I don't do it in love, I'm nothing. He said, I could even be sacrificial and give all my goods to the poor and give my body to be burned, but if I don't do it in love, it profits me nothing. Well, I mean, that's a pretty bold statement, isn't it? And then he goes on and he gives us a 15-point definition of love. 1 Corinthians 13, the only time you ever hear it is at weddings. And we tell new couples that because they're only going to be able to do it for about a day and then they're going to go back to their business as usual. It's a tough thing and we'll look at it another time. But he goes through this 15-point definition of love. Love is patient, love is kind, you know the one. And then at the end of it, he says maybe the most powerful statement in all of the New Testament, verse 8, he says, love never fails. Say love never fails. Love never fails. So let's, let's recap here. So he tells us if you're going to use the gifts of the Spirit, these fantastic gifts, you better do it in love. Because if you don't do it in love, they're of no value to you. They're not going to profit you. And so I want to extrapolate this idea for a moment and say, if you need love to operate in spiritual gifts, how about our natural gifts? How about our gifts, our skills, our talents? How about the things we use every day, our intelligence and our wisdom and our knowledge that maybe is not supernatural, but God gave us to us? Could it be that if we don't do those things and use those things in love, then we are nothing and it profits us nothing in those things? And here's my thesis for today. I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to prove to you today, that love is the single greatest success principle in the universe. It is so powerful because if we do anything in our life in love, what will happen is it will transform what we do and make it far more effective. I mean, think about this. What would happen if we took love into our communities and into our workplaces and into our, not just into our families, not just into our friends, but the places in which we live every day, our clients, our students, our patients, our customers? See, here's what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, if you only love people who love you back, he says, the pagans do that. He says, there is no reward in that. Did you hear that? He said, there's no reward, there's no profit if you only love people who love you back. And he says, the key to this whole thing is to love people that might not necessarily love you back. And so what would happen if we began to do life, as it were, but we did it in love? So Jesus tells us this. He tells us in the Gospels that there's some groups of people we're supposed to love. He says we're supposed to love one another, right? He told us that. He told us we're supposed to love our brother. He told us we're supposed to love our neighbor, and we're supposed to love our enemy. When you look at those four groups of people, what do those four groups include? How many people? All of them, right? Doesn't that pretty much include everybody? I mean, everybody fits into one of those categories. And so the command, the commission is for us to be people that know how to express our love to others in the world, which pretty much includes everybody. Now, here's the hard part. So, okay, that's what you want me to be, do. So tomorrow morning, I'm going to get up, and I'm just going to love everybody. Well, good luck with that, because it's a challenge. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you the more excellent way. And I'm going to tell you how this process works and how you could get to that place where you could love better or more than you are now. And here it is, I'm going to throw it up on the screen. I sort of see it as three steps or three levels. And the first one is this, it's God's love for us. Second one is God's love in us. And the third one is God's love through us. It all begins with God's love for us. When you look at the New Testament, I would argue that the central, single central theme of the New Testament is love. 229 times love is mentioned. It begins with these words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The whole journey begins with the fact that God first loved us before we even loved him. While we were still yet enemies of God, he demonstrated his love towards us. So it all begins that way. And if there was one person in Scripture in the New Testament that talks more about love than any other, you know who it is? It's the Apostle 
John. He's called the Apostle of Love. And it kind of cracks me up if you go read, a, read his own writings, like the Gospel of John, he refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. I think that's sort of audacious to make that claim, don't you? I mean, if I was going to pick one of these guys, it wouldn't be John. I'd pick Peter, wouldn't you? Seemed like, seemed like Jesus, kind of love-hate relationship, but I think he loved him the most. No, John says it's him, the disciple that Jesus loved. And it says the disciple that Jesus loved lay with his head on his breast. Oh, who's he fooling? He had his brother James there. How about James? Why didn't Jesus love James? Well, here's the irony in all this. When you look at these two guys, these two brothers, John and James, what was their nickname? The sons of? <laughs> sons of Thunder. And you remember it? You remember the story? They were in Samaria. Jesus was preaching to the Samaritans. They didn't receive Jesus' word, so John and James came up with a pretty swell idea. They said, would you like us to call fire down from heaven and consume them? And Jesus rebuked them and said, you do not know what spirit you were of. You see, Jesus came in the spirit of love. These guys came in the spirit of vengeance. But yet, somewhere along the line, something transformational changed. John had some sort of revelation, some sort of epiphany of the love of God for him. And then you go into his writings. Go read 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. That's all he talks about is love. And he begins by saying, God is love. And if God's love is in you, then you will show love to others. And if you don't love others, then I tell you that God's love is not even in you. And so he understood something. He had this experience with God's love for him that changed who he was to the point, as I said, that he got this nickname, the Apostle of Love. And so here, here's what I've discovered, that, that what we really need, the first step, is we need to begin to appreciate God's love for us the fact that he reached down from his throne in heaven, that he loved us even when we were far away from him. And before the foundation of the earth, he loved you. And it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you've done, God's love is always expressed to you, and there is a bit of a revelation of that. And here's the thing that I've discovered in working with people. I found that people who are lifelong Christians that don't remember ever being fallen away from God they're, they oftentimes have a harder time showing devotion to God than those who have come to Christ as adults and who knew they were sinners and knew they were far from God. And Jesus talked about that. He said, he who is forgiven much, what? Loves much. And it's really true. And when we look at these people that have experienced the forgiveness of God in an extraordinary and demonstrative way, then we find these people actually able to love incredibly well. I want to tell you a story about a gal in this church, her and her husband. I'm going to change their names. I'm going to call them Donna and Doug. Some of you are going to recognize them, but I'm going to do my best to disguise their identity. And so Donna and Doug, before they came to church, they were really, really having a rough go. I mean, they were both living sinful lives. Their lives were kind of a mess. Their marriage was right on the verge of collapsing. And they came to this church, and they came to Christ, and they discovered the love of God and the forgiveness of God. And both of them have become incredible people, amazing Christian people that love and give and serve. And Donna, in particular, is one of the most effusive people you ever meet. I mean, when she expresses her emotions, she does it in an incredibly demonstrative, over-the-top way, and it's just kind of who she is. And uh, so here's what happened with her. One day, uh, she, she ended up getting a job with a Christian organization, part-time job. And uh, they just didn't know what to do with her. They, like, she was just too much for them. She was just too effusive and too demonstrative in her emotions. And so finally he decided, the director of this ministry decided he was going to let her go. And so that's what was happening. And so Donna decided that he, she was going to march up to him and tell him how she felt about him. And she did it publicly. There was an event going on. He was in the, in the corridor. There was a bunch of people around. She marched right up to him looked him right in the eye, grabbed him by the shoulders, and I'll call him Dave Johnson. And she looked him right in the eye and said, Dave Johnson, I love you, Dave Johnson. I love you, Dave Johnson, <laughs> right in front of all these other people. And he doesn't know what to do with this. He is being abused with love. <laughs> and, 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 you know, he just didn't know, actually know what to do with this. And she just looked him in the eyes and just kept on repeating, I want you to know I love you. And he was completely discombobulated. He didn't know what to do with this. He was so upset. And so anyway, the, she, what she was saying, understand this, what she was saying was, 
I don't care with this, what happens here. I don't care what happens with my job. I'm going to love you no matter what. And she was expressing that because she's just a very expressive person. So, so he phones me up. He's all upset. He phones me up. He knows me. He knows she's in the church. He phones me up. And he says, Mark, i got to talk to you about this, this woman, Donna, in your church. Let me tell you what she did. She, and I had already heard the story from, from her, so I knew the story. And, uh, but it was funny hearing it from him. And he says, she accosted me in the middle of this other people, and she shouts in my face, I love you, Dave Johnson. Why would she do such a thing? I said, I'll tell you why. Because she loves you. <laughs> That's why. I'm trying not to laugh. Eh? And, uh, you know, here's the thing. I mean, Donna phones me once a month and tells me she loves me. It's not weird. It's not creepy. It's no, not romantic. It's just who she is. Now, it's easier for me because I have women telling me they love me all the time, right? I mean, you can you could well imagine that. And <laughs> I'm kidding, for goodness sake. I have a few. They're mostly, like, married to me. And so... <laughs> And so anyway, I'm laughing. I'm killing myself to this story. And I'm not being much help to him. I said, well, it sounds to me like she loves you. Well, not only that, you know what she did? She phoned me three times at home. She phones me after dinner at home. What's she doing calling me at home? I said, I think she loves you. <laughs> That's why she's calling you at home. And of course, I'm not being any help to him. Because I think it's funny. Because I know her. Because I know she's not being romantic. She wasn't hitting on him. She wasn't trying to embarrass him. What she was trying to do in a very wholesome way, maybe a little over the top, I get it. But she was saying, I don't care what happens. I love you. And this relationship's going to continue whether the job does or doesn't. Right? Now, I'm not suggesting this next time you're in an exit interview as your best strategy. <laughs> I, you know, it didn't totally work with her, but I understand why she would do such a thing because that's who she is. And what would happen if we began to be able to express our love for people a little better than we do now? Is it's all about understanding God's love for us. Now, the second part of it is God's love in us. Now, when we understand that God loved us, then his love actually does something in us. There should, should be some demonstrable effect within you emotionally and mentally and psychologically when you get loved by God and you understand that. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit of a story uh, uh, medically about love because it's really fascinating. There are some psychologists believe, not all, but some, that there are only two primal human emotions and they are fear and they are love. And then all the other emotions, and there's lots of emotions, but they all come out of one or the other. And so that the fear is the base emotion for all negative emotions. So things like anger and vengeance and bitterness and depression and greed and all those things actually come out of that one emotion of fear. And then love actually brings forth all of the positive emotions, like generosity and kindness and joy and you know, honor for others and respect. And when you start to look at it on that sort of base level, it kind of makes sense. And so there was a, an interesting experiment that was done on this at Harvard Medical School. And it was actually two different research projects. One was doing fear, the other one was doing love. And the one on fear was really interesting because what they wanted to do is they wanted to find out what actually happens when someone is fearful, when someone is actually scared. So they got a bunch of students together and they had them hooked up to MRI and different you know, sensors and different things, and they were scaring the bejesus out of them. And uh, what happened was they looked to see where did the fear response start, and they found out it starts in the amygdala of the brain, and then it, what it does is it sends signals everywhere else, and the whole body reacts, not only you know, uh, psychologically and neurologically, but physiologically. And you know what I'm talking about. Your body produces adrenaline. The next thing you know, your heart's racing. The next thing you know, your blood pressure's gone up. You're breathing more rapidly. Then what happens, you're getting more oxygen to your brain. You're, you become more mentally alert, but not in a good way. You've all experienced fear, right? Where all of a sudden you've been afraid and almost instantaneous, everything changed within you, both emotionally and physically. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You've all experienced this. Fear has this incredibly powerful effect on you. And so they discovered that what happened was then they, the two responses are either fight or flight. And so interesting, you know, experiment on what and how fear works. So then they did another one, a different group of people, and they were doing love. And they took 2,500 college students, and they put them in an MRI, 
and they wanted to examine the brain and see what effects the brain had, and this is what they did, it was very simple. They showed the students pictures of people that were family and friends, people they loved, and then people that they knew but were just acquaintances. And then they wanted to measure the brain response. And uh, here's, here's what it looked like. Here's a sample of one of the MRIs. So the, the one on the left was what happened when they saw a picture of someone they loved. There was a, a more extraordinary uh, effect on the brain than on someone that was just an acquaintance. It was kind of neutral. And so to you know, help analyze these scans in, into layman's language, the one on the left, when you see someone you love, it's yabba dabba do. And when you see someone that's an acquaintance, it's yeah. That, that's, that's the difference. And you all know this, you all understand this, but the brain actually responds to these things. And so here's what happens. When they showed these students pictures of people that they actually love, family and friends, the brain actually released the hormone dopamine. And dopamine is, of course, the, you know, the so-called uh, feel-good uh, neurotransmitter. And it actually has, makes you feel good, and it makes you change. And, and it not only affected them, again, mentally, but also physically and emotionally. And one of the things that it did, I thought this was kind of funny, they talked about this, was it stimulates an area of the brain, and I'm going to give you a scientific name for it, it's called the rewards detection center of the brain. <laughs> you know I'm making that up, right? But that was the, the area of the brain that, that re accepts that. So here's what happens. When, when you are in love, and when you love someone, and when you even just see that person, what it does is, is it produces a response in your brain that you think you're going to be rewarded. Boy, is your brain in for a surprise, right? <laughs> it doesn't always happen. And so here we have this picture, I'm trying to paint this picture, that fear and love have two radically different emotional responses in the human being. And then you look into the scripture, and you see that the scripture actually talks about the interface between those two things 2,000 years ago, Paul said in 2 Timothy that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Why is it that he's talking about love and fear? I'll tell you why. Because they are contradictory competing factors in your psyche. And he says, God has not given you this spirit of fear, but he has given you the power and love and a sound mind. And you have a sound mind because you have love. And then John comes along, the, the apostle of love, remember him? And he comes along, 1 John chapter 4, here it is, and it says this. He says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. And I know you've read that a bunch of times, you thought, I don't get it. What do you mean perfect love casts out fear? You see, what happens when you experience the love of God in you, then fear just dissipates. The Bible knew this 2,000 years before science figured it out. And so there's the love of God for you, the love of God in you, and the last and the final thing is this, it's the love of God through you. So here's my thesis. I said it's the greatest success principle, that if God's love began to work in us, that we began to experience it and understand it and have this revelation of his love for us, then it would do something in us and then, by consequence, it would begin to leak out of us. And we would begin to love the world through us. And that's how you get there. You can't just wake up one morning and say, I'm going to love everybody all the time. It's too hard to do. But once you've had this experience with God's love, it just begins to seep out of you. So let me close with one final story here that I think will sum this whole thing up. So Kathy and I, we've been married a long time. We've been married 38 years. And one of the reasons we've lasted that long is we, we still go on dates. And not every week, but most every week, I take Kathy out for lunch and uh, find a day off, take her out for lunch. The reason I take her out for lunch is dinner is way too expensive, so I'm not springing for that. <laughs> so, so we go out for lunch, and, and uh, you know, we'll find a restaurant. We'll, can, we'll just go to that restaurant, and we go almost every week, and we just sit there, and we talk about life, and talk about our day, and whisper sweet nothings into one another's ears. You know, you can imagine us doing that. And, uh, you know, we just want to maintain a relationship. And so, you know, when we find a restaurant we like, we continue to go to that restaurant. So about 12 or maybe 15 years ago, I don't remember exactly when it was, we went into this restaurant, and we sat down, and we hadn't been there before, and the waitress came by, and she was, kind of looked kind of grumpy to us, and she sat down 
or so, so we sat down, she came and said, what can I do for you? And so, you know, we told her what we were going to have, and she left, and I remember turning to Kathy, and I said, so she's kind of a grumpy pants, isn't she? And we said, yeah, she's kind of a grumpy pants. So then Grump grumpy pants came, brought us our meal, and, and it, it was a pretty good meal. And so the next week, we decided we were going to go back. And so we came in, and, and Kathy says, where do you want to sit? And I said, Let, let's sit in little Miss Grumpy Pants section, see if we can't cheer her up. And so we went over, and we sat there, and she came by again. And, and so we did this week after week after week, and we found out that she actually wasn't grumpy at all. It just, you know, she had that kind of demeanor. It wasn't grumpy a person at all, but she had had a very rough life and had really a tough time. And you know what we did? We just went in week after week, and we started taking an interest in her. And we would start asking her about her life. And we know everything about her life. And uh, she would come and, and we would ask her questions. We knew that she was a single mom. She was a career waitress. We knew that she had two grandchildren, a boy and a girl. We knew how old they were. And uh, we developed this friendship with her. We took a genuine interest in who she was as a person. And she didn't often ask us about us, but she loved to talk about herself because we took an interest in her. And when we walked into that restaurant, she would light up. And we would see her light up. And by the time we were sitting down in our seats and had our jackets off, she had our drinks in front of us. And then she, she would leave other customers to come and serve us. <laughs> because she, she knew who her friends were. And so she'd be serving us our drinks. She said, I put in your order with Tony. I'm assuming you're having the same thing. I told him to do something a little extra special for you today. And she treated us like absolute gold. And we loved her back. I mean, on Christmas, we brought her gifts, and I brought her a Bible, and we brought her videos for her grandkids. And every week, she would tell us what was going on. She would tell us what day she was babysitting her grandkids. She'd tell us about taking them to the zoo. She would tell us about the birthday party they had on Sunday. It was a real re relationship. It was a real friendship. And you know what? We loved this woman. We just loved her and cared for her, and she cared for us. And even though I didn't really hang out with her and know where she was, but we did our date night. You know, our date, it was just the three of us, me, Kathy, and Janet. And uh, so then anyway, what happened, this went on for 10 years. And after 10 years, we, we came in one day and we sat down and we said to the waitress, Where, where's Janet? And uh, she said, oh, uh, and she called the, the manager over. The manager knew us. We'd been coming there a long time. And the manager said, you know what, J Janet's actually not doing well. She, she's sick. And we said, well, what do you mean sick? Like, how sick? And then she gulped and she said she doesn't want to tell us to tell anybody, but we're going to tell you. And she's been diagnosed with lung cancer. And uh, she'd been a heavy smoker and it caught up with her. And uh, she said she's been diagnosed with lung cancer and I don't think she's coming back. And uh, so we said to her, well, we'd like to go see her. And uh, can we go see her? And they said, no, she doesn't want to see anyone. We're not going to tell you. We didn't know where she lived. We didn't know. Where, that was the only place we knew was from the restaurant. And we didn't know where she lived. And, and so we wanted to go, but we couldn't go, so we didn't go. And then about two weeks later, we came in, we sat down, and the manager spotted us. And she had that look on her face, and we knew what. And she walked over, and she said, I got some bad news for you guys. Janet passed away this week. And I remember how heartbroken we were. because so we spent 10 years with this woman going for lunch. And, uh, you know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't just a waiter and a customer. It was a relationship that had developed over 10 years, and we knew her family, and we knew her family's name, and we knew her kids and her grandkids. And, and, uh, and I remember how sad we were in that moment. And then the manager said this. She said, we're going to have a, a special memorial celebration just for the staff here at the restaurant. And we'd like to invite you to, because we know how special you are to her. And we were the only customers that got extended that invitation. And you know why? Because we loved her, and she loved us back. And you know what? That's a picture of life, people. We can make all the difference in the world. The greatest success principle that you will ever initiate in your life is a more excellent way, and it's called love, because love never fails. Let's stand together, shall we? Church of the Rock has services every Sunday at 1397 Buffalo Place, and we invite you to join us when you're in the Winnipeg area. If you'd like a booklet to help you understand more about God's gift of forgiveness and reconciliation through Jesus Christ, please contact us, and we'd be happy to send you a free copy of the Book of Hope.
visit our website at www.churchoftherock.ca. Thank you for watching and God bless you.